Good morning to everyone. I'd like to thank the organization, Ecolab, uh, for the invitation. Uh, I'd like to just uh, correct a little bit of the presentation. I'm from, I'm a clinical risk manager and patient safety official from the, uh, uh, one of the greatest healthcare trusts in the region of Tuscany in Italy. And my job this morning is to just take you a little bit away from the technical aspects and bring you into the aspects of risk management, especially with a focus on pneumology. Well, when did risk management all be begun? It began in a very long time ago. And in 1999, in this publication, the medical world realized that patients in the hospitals get more harm than either normal citizens traveling on an airline. But what happened after that publication is very significant because there's a lot of research in risk management and patient safety. Personally, I am a surgeon. I'm an emergency surgeon, and I work in Florence, not in the university, in a, in a, in a hospital area. But when I first approached the field of patient safety and risk management uh, topics, I was very amazed to understand how probably maybe not, not many uh, physicians or healthcare workers in the world are um, aware of how important patient safety is in this field. And risk management is, clinical risk management is a part of all these settings and each one of these settings, each one of these, uh, these tiles have an importance in our, in our job. And I'll focus on them in your field at the end of my presentation. And what does a risk manager do? Well, first of all, a clinical risk manager and a patient safety official cannot stay in front of a desk or behind a desk. He has to keep up on a frontline basis. He has to stay with clinicians. He has to be in the endoscopy room. He has to see what's happening on the front line. And he uses these instruments that we have, clinical analysis, FEMEA, uh, clinical audit, root cause analysis, either on a reactive or on a proactive basis. And what relations does a clinical risk manager have with all these people dealing in the field of, of, uh, of medicine? Well, first of all, he has an important role also in the lawsuit aspects, which is a very, very peculiar and delicate situation. I don't know in your countries what happens, but now in Italy we have a new law, a new law that seems to give a little bit of protection to healthcare workers when they're, uh, when they're called for lawsuits on a civil responsibility basis, not, of course, on a penal responsibility basis. And what, uh, what profile does a clinical risk manager have to have? Well, we believe that he has to be an expert in human factors. He's not only a clinician in the specialist field, for example, in your field, but he also has to be an ergonomist. He has to understand human factor and uh, behavior. He has to understand the quality of healthcare systems. He has to understand what the systematic approach to adverse events are. And that's what I'm about to talk to you at the end about how dealing with major adverse events in your field, in the field of bronchoscopy. And the operational fields mainly of a clinical risk manager are the fields that you see in this slide. I underlined in red the incident reporting and learning system apparatus, which is the first step to understand how patients are harmed or how uh, medical mishaps, medical errors occur in your organization, in a medical organization. These are clinical best practices that uh, my region in Tuscany and Italy help to uh, spread abroad all over our country, all over Europe. They're clinical practices based on evidence, on evidence-based medicine, evidence-based nursing, evidence-based clinical practicing. And they help us a lot. But as I heard in other presentations this morning, we have to be able to also measure 
ourselves. And measuring ourselves is not only measuring on the output of clinical excellence, but we have to also compare it to the safety processes in our hospitals, in our healthcare institutions. And when I say we have to measure ourselves, I'm also talking about patient safety indicators, which have a very, very hard impact, a very hard and high impact, also on an economical point of view. And then, what do we deal with mainly? We deal with all these criticalities. These are transverse uh, um, um, adverse events that occur also in your field. And as you can see, among the main, maybe some of the most less happening in your field, you can see that some of the criticalities that we deal also in examining clinical charts and records, as you can see in this slide, are one of the major challenges also to assure patient safety. And how do we deal with all these problems? First of all, we go on to the front line. We use patient safety walk rounds to understand how clinicians are doing. And we would like, and personally, I'm conducting a research, an observational research study in my hospital where I want to see what the problems are in an endoscopy room and in endoscopy procedures transversely. And, well, let's get to your section. Well, what are one of the major uh, problems that uh, we have as a risk manager and patient safety official have as reported from, uh, from the endoscopy uh, world, from the endoscopy specialties? Well, mainly preventing infections. Of course, you can see this ECRI report list and you can see that endoscope reprocessing failures continue to expose patients to risk. And we all know that hospital-acquired infections are one of the major causes not only of lawsuits, not only of legal, in, uh, of legal um, um, interventions against uh, per professionals, but also against the uh, exhaustion of our economy. They're too highly expensive for our economy to uh, to reimburse. And of course, that's our focus on reprocessing, proper cleaning, and to avoid transverse cross-infectional uh, situations. And the goals of this, of sterile processing or high-level processing are the ones that you can see in this, in this slide. I don't want to uh, waste most of your time, but what I would like to point out is that we need regulatory requirements in order to uh, standardize practices and applications in our in the field and the facts are that what we read through the uh, through the uh, through the papers through the uh, to, through the outbreaks of hospital acquired infections mainly in your sectors well we have to have this joint commission's uh, uh, facts approval and we have to say that a lack of leadership uh, oversight a staff lack in the knowledge of training. Training has been uh, talked about much this morning, I've heard in, uh, in previous uh, presentations. The lack of a safety, of a culture of safety. Well, ask yourselves, ask your, your trainees, what is the culture of safety? And this has to be underlined also in many simulation courses and in, for, in, in education and training future uh, healthcare workers. And so, all these facts bring us to understand that in order to um, reduce the risk of adverse events caused by medical errors or organizational errors, we have to focus on training people, training their assets, training also political, political solutions and standardizations in healthcare organizations across the world. We cannot save money in healthcare. Money is supposed to, be, uh, supposed to be spent and investments are to be promoted in the, healthcare, in the healthcare role. Well, articles like this focus on the fact that if this happens, you can get a very, very bad reputation and a bad image. And I don't think that this could be much affording. And we risk managers help the frontline professionals to just to avoid this. And during COVID, we were called on to analyze how the impact of COVID had on the, 
had on all uh, healthcare areas. And of course, in this, uh, in this, in this article, you can see that when re the, the, the meaning of reusable bronchoscopes, as the previous author taught, uh, and it's a discussion that is now really, really on the job, I mean, among indus industries and healthcare workers and many also institutions of, of, uh, of, of um, in, in interventional uh, bronchology. Well, these are the topics of choice that we have to understand. Is it useful or is it not useful? And this, of course, needs a lot of research and deepen evaluation among first-line workers. And last but not least, and I would like to finish this presentation showing you a few slides on the impact, the economical impact of hospital-acquired infections on a hospital's economy. Well, this is a formula that we learned from the Canadian Patient Safety Institute, and we simulated the cost of a of a, of a hospital acquired infection in terms of economical impact. And it's a formula. We put the data in, from my country. We, we put the data of what we registered in Italy. For example, 5.3 is the average national annual percentage of adverse events, potentially harmful adverse events that occur in our healthcare system. 10 million and, and, and et cetera number is the number of average hospital admissions per year in my country. 11 is the number of days, average number of days of prolonging uh, hospital stay due to uh, a hospital acquired infection. And well, that's a very, very old uh, amount of euros, which is the daily cost of a hospital bed. Now you can imagine it's at least double that, that, uh, that sum. And also if you look at uh, intensive care beds, they're not only doubled, but they're triplicated or quadruplicated. Well, if you multiply all these indicators, all these factors, and you understand what happens at the end, you can see that I can't even pronounce that number. I can't even understand, I can't even say it. I don't know how, how to say it. But that's the cost of a hospital acquired infection upon a simulation basis, and if 50% of all adverse events are avoidable and preventable, well, then we can at least save 50% of that sum. And may I point out that at least 15% of a hospital budget goes into lawsuit and malpractice issues and claims. Well, this has to be something that we have to reflect on for the near future. And, well, what about the responsibilities and, and, um, and the jurisdictional point of view of of doctors, of physicians, of healthcare workers, all. Well, it's a very, very important, uh, important topic. And now in Italy, we're really trying to understand how we can change our insurance policy regulamentation just to uh, bring back a more, uh, let's say, passion into future students, into future uh, individuals who would like to under, undergo the, uh, the, the medical profession. Because right now, I don't know in your country, but in my country we're suffering from a very, very hard type of, uh, dis, uh, of, of not, not many students are, uh, go, go to the university to become doctors and to become physicians so accordingly. And how these solutions may be proposed, I would like to say that these are the challenges of the future. Reflect on all of these and, re and bring them into your field. Look at the topics, affordability, sustainability, resilience, value-based healthcare. This is the most important challenge of the future. And of course, accountability, equity, safety, assurance, care and cure, and evidence-based healthcare. These are the challenges of the future. And with all that I've heard of from this morning, I think there's a lot of possibilities to get these very, very, uh, you know, uh, put in and solidificated into our future. And I would like to finish with my, one of my uh, teachers in patient safety, my master teachers in patient safety, Professor James Reason, uh, an ergonomic and a, a cognitive psychologist, when he said to me, and he said, well, we can't change human beings, 
but we have to change the conditions under which humans work. That means let's shift our attention not only to humans and not only find out who the culprit is, but let's see if we can improve our organizations and our equipment. Just exactly what I've heard here this morning. Thank you very much for your, for your attention.